especially because he agreed to share his insights with us on very short notice. So before we get to the Q&A, let me just um, set the stage talking about the world we live in. The global economy is slowing down and we have an escalation of the trade war between China and the US. That is relevant for us because that's weighing down on oil demand and that's depressing somewhat oil prices. But the global economy is not the only factor that is impacting oil prices. We have environmental concerns which are shifting the energy mix away from oil towards renewables. We have technology which is making certain types of crude oil more available and cheaper for extract. And that's again exerting downward pressure on oil prices. But that's not the only technology that is relevant. So there is something called Twitter and we have um, an American president who is fond of that technology. And he occasionally tweets about oil and that leads to fluctuations in oil prices. So that's another challenge to address. Within the region, we had oil exporters have yet to recover from the oil price shock, the decline in oil prices in 2014. Iraq, however, has come a long way since 2014. We've seen an improvement in the security situation. Uh, we have seen the partial recovery of oil prices is reducing the vulnerabilities in the economy. And we're seeing in, in a region and a world that's becoming more polarized, Iraq has a healthy and friendly relationship with countries in the region and abroad. So it stands, like, um, it stands in a un unique position and we see that reflected in the participation of this forum. But the picture is not completely rosy. Um, there are challenges and problems and issues that I'm sure we'll be at talking about and discussing over the next four days that are facing Iraq. We have the issue of corruption that needs to be tackled if Iraq is to become a dynamic and, uh, and diversified economy. We have the issue of reconstruction in post-war regions. And we have the issue of public services, electricity, education, and health, uh, which needs to come up to an ad adequate level. So we have plenty dis to discuss over the next four days, starting with this panel. Let me get straight to the topic and talk about global oil markets. Let me start with Mr. Barkindo. So we have a world economy that's slowing. Demand for oil is slowing. We have a surge in U.S. shale. Our friends at the International Energy Agency tell us that uh, we're going to have a daunting surplus next year. Should OPEC cut its production or is extend its production cuts? Should it deepen the production cuts and should it extend it? Uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to join this uh, panel of uh, distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, your uh, topic as well as the question that you posed to me are very pertinent and very timely. It's correct that uh, we're beginning to see uh, some deceleration in the growth rate of the global economy. We have just revised down our 2019 and 2020 forecast to about 3% uh, to 3.1%. And correspondingly, as expected, demand which is mainly driven by global economic growth is also trending a little bit lower. But be that as it may, uh, the numbers that we see today, about one million barrels a day incremental demand uh, still remains healthy. We would have liked to see uh, a much higher number, uh, but uh, the global economy uh, dictates uh, enlarge uh, the demand growth for oil. It is also correct to say that uh, the surge in U.S. tight oil that we have seen in the past several years could be described as phenomenal. Who would have thought some few years ago that the technology of fracking uh, that uh, was almost exclusively applied in the gas fields uh, would be adopted in uh, oil reservoirs? Now, technology uh, is the driver in 
Baku in 1846 uh, to date. Now, how do we proceed in the year 2020? Now, I also made reference to the outcome of the 16th Joint Ministerial Monitoring Committee in Abu Dhabi just a couple of days ago where we took stock we compared notes, we analyzed data from all the sources and in OPEC, we are also relying on six other secondary sources, not only from our member countries, to be able to give us the complete picture before Samir al Ghadban and his colleagues can take informed uh, decisions. Now, what is different this time around? We have seen in Abu Dhabi a firm commitment of the number one producer in the OPEC plus, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The newly appointed Minister of Energy, His Highness Abdulaziz bin Salman, has hit the ground running. He came to Abu Dhabi for his inaugural first meeting with us as minister, and he has reiterated to Samir and his colleagues and all of us that there will be no change in Saudi policy. He is here to continue the excellent work done by his predecessor, Khalid al-Fali. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has been the epitome of stability in terms of policy. And they have provided this leadership from 2017 when we started implementing the supply adjustments. They have gone far and above what they are required under the deal in order to provide their leadership, to carry everybody along, uh, to commit themselves to restoring stability on a sustainable basis. Secondly, Iraq, the second largest producer, and I want you to underline this, in the whole group, there is no country, according to our data, that has the growth potentials of Iraq. Iraq has a huge growth potential going forward. And we believe that the worst is over for Iraq. They are now poised for a new phase of growth and development. Therefore, the supply adjustments to maintain stability in the market in particular 2020, Iraq must be a strong player. Iraq must show that leadership. And Samir al Ghadban has made it very clear in our meetings behind closed doors, at the press conference to the world media, he has backed his words with numbers for the first time. Ministers normally they don't like to be pushed to numbers. They are policy makers. But he went ahead and provided us with numbers. So let's, so let's get the numbers from Mr. Thamer Ghadban. Mr. Thamer, what yeah. are the numbers and should OPEC cut deeper and longer? Well, uh, I mean, uh, you, you said it clearly that uh, forecast for year 2020 is not that uh, bright and people now talking about recessions and uh, but uh, we have to be also careful about those forecasts. Uh, uh, from time to time, they revise their even last year forecasts. So, okay. But we have to be prepared for 2020 because Iraq is, will be mostly affected because, as I said earlier in my introductory speech, that uh, oil revenues provide almost 90% of the annual budget. Uh, supplies. On the other hand, uh, what we have agreed in Abu Dhabi, first of all, is that the conformity of OPEC and non-OPEC member countries to their share should be enhanced, okay? What happened in our case during the summer season, as you know, and everybody, because they live here, most of them, and even our guests, they know that, we are a very hot country, and uh, the, the present government, based on the experience of last year, we have taken all extra measures in order 
to provide maximum power supply possible, especially to the hot region in the south of Iraq and particularly to the city of Basra. And uh, thank God and thank to the people who are engaged on the implementation that we have passed through the hot months uh, with uh, increased supplies. The, actually, the peak load this summer exceeded 19,000 uh, megawatts. As compared with last year, there is an excess of 2,500 to 3,000 uh, megawatt as compared with last year. And this meant that we had to uh, bear more oil for power generation. So normally during the mild uh, months, we consume about 75,000 barrel per day, while in summer we consumed more than 200 thousand barrel per day. So now so, summer is almost over. Okay, so there will be a cut of at least 125,000 barrel per by day by power. I mean, soon. soon. I have ordered. Plus, of course, we have ordered, uh, I have ordered a cut in the export mm. as of two days ago. And, uh, and I promise that Iraq will be increasing its conformity this month and definitely in October. So this on October, Iraq will comply with the OPEC we'll cuts. Do, yes, sir. Does we'll that do also best. include but let me add one point production more. from the Kurdistan let, region? Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm coming to. Production in Kurdistan, export plus smaller local consumption, almost reaches uh, 500,000 world per day. Mm. Uh, this is not under the control of the federal government. But on the other hand, there are now, right, I mean, last week and two weeks earlier, even a month earlier, there are now very constructive dialogue. There is constructive dialogue between uh, the federal government and KRG government. And we are optimistic that a deal will be reached uh, very soon. And that, of course, in this case, KRG should really comply by, uh, with a unified policy as far as production of oil is concerned. Because OPEC looks at the federal government, mm -hmm. okay, not at regional government. And therefore, we should really comply. Our quota is 4,515,000 barrels per day. Okay? We, in summer, exceeded that mm -hmm. because of the reason I mentioned. Uh, mind you, also, the, during the summer, of course, there are longer hours, and normally Iraqis consume more uh, oil products, gasoline and gas oil, during those, those months. Mm -hmm. And for that, we had to refine more. Than normal. So I, I'm very optimistic that uh, we will comply. So just Plus, to be clear, the compliance will include the KRG by October or not? We'll do our best to, uh, they should really conform and, uh, with us together and Sounds we good. should be in the same boat. Finally, the judgment within the OPEC uh, JMMC, OPEC Plus uh, meeting in Abu Dhabi is that let us wait till December. There will be another joint ministerial monitoring committee. Yeah. And then it is up to the minister to decide in December whether we continue at the same level of the cuts or whether we opt for a deeper cut. Okay. Thank you. Can I just ask one more question? Because one of the themes of the panel is yes. geopolitics. Iraq is very dependent on oil for its economy. Most of Iraqi exports go through Basra. They go through yeah. the Gulf. They go to the Strait of Hormuz. We had lots of news about incidents there. Is there a plan to diversify uh, the export routes? We've heard about plans for pipelines in the past. Yeah. What's the progress on this? What are the capacity? What is the timeline? The plan is actually now under implementation. First of all, we are going to replace uh, the old Iraqi Turkish pipeline, which was destroyed by the terrorist organization Daesh. Uh, already we have contacted uh, a number of uh, uh, major, major EPC contractors and uh, interested parties in that. And uh, um, actually, there is a very s strong interest in this project. It's a mega project, one million barrel per day from Kirkuk all the way to Fishkabur, mm. uh, the Turkish-Iraqi border at the measuring station. Another mega project is from the Rumela, the south in Basra all the way to Aqaba. Mm. But it is uh, composed of two segments. The first one, from Romela to Hadith, uh, along the same old strategic pipeline uh, route, uh, it, it is a much uh, larger diameter pipeline, 56 inch pipeline, two and a quarter million per, per day capacity. Right. And the second segment from Hadith, uh, 
all the way to Aqaba. Of course, this will have also storage tanks, pump stations, as well as uh, uh, an offshore terminal uh, in the Aqaba. Okay. And what's the capacity of this? The capacity one million for and the export. The well, we are already now uh, contacting interested parties. One more important point is that there will be a linkage between the two systems, mm -hmm. and this will give Iraq a flexibility to, you know, direct the oil to Aqaba as well as from the south as well as to Jihan on the Mediterranean. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, let me bring Mr. Joe Kaiser here to the conversation. Uh, well, you've signed contracts with Iraq worth about 700 million euros. You are here in Baghdad attending this forum. Are you also signing new deals here in Iraq while you're here? Well, it, it, look, it always depends uh, on where we can help and what we can do. We've been working together and uh, have um, developed a roadmap for Iraq, which is basically a roadmap also for the Iraqi people, because it does not only contain to produce more energy or to produce better, more reliable and affordable energy, uh, and electricity, it's also about how can we bring jobs, how can we bring, bring training, you know, for young people to give them a future, and also how we can invest more in infrastructure, because if you want to rebuild a country, it's not about security, it's not about electricity, it's not about energy only, it is also about how bring you, do you bring the prerequisites for industrialization, because that industrialization is actually the key for diversifying industries. Before that, it's very hard to imagine. So um, we, are, we are very happy with uh, what we are able to achieve together in a very, in a very, very intense dialogue. Could it be quicker? Absolutely. Because we've shown that, for example, in Egypt, where we built 14,000 megawatt in two years. But on the other hand, you know, every country is different. And if you look back what uh, Iraq and the Iraqi government has achieved by, you know, basically getting the terrorists uh, down to where they belong to, take out Daesh, you know, rebuild, uh, free up the zones and then get the basics back, you know, a country can only, and its people and its government can only do so much at a time. So I think that's why it's so important to keep a very close dialogue. What is it where we can set the priorities? I mentioned the example of uh, getting 800 megawatt basically cost-free till the next summer. Is that 14,000 megawatt? Of course not. Is that a mega project? Of course not. But it's 800 megawatt in 10 months and people will notice it in summer. Mm -hmm. So the people will say, oh man, you know, the government finally gets something done. And that increases the confidence. And that increases the reputation and the power of the government. So things develop and accelerate over time. And that's why we are very grateful, diligent, and patient, you know, to, to, to always compare what is desirable and what is doable. And that's not always the same. Sure. So should we expect, expect imminent announcements uh, between Siemens and Iraq? Or? I'm not expecting anything. I'm offering our help of a company which is as strong as it has never been before. We're offering our assistance about building societal development alongside with obviously our profit interest. I mean, we are not a dot .org company. We need to make money because otherwise we cannot serve society. That's clear. But I'm very, very eager to create a balanced economic development for the people of Iraq. So That's why I'm here for the fourth time in less than two years. So Siemens are making are offering their services, Mr. Thamer? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the chairman and uh, really appreciate all the initiatives we met earlier uh, a few months ago and uh, what was really uh, very you know, appreciative from my side. And he said it today that every dollar they will generate, they will keep it in Iraq and expand their uh, commitment to Iraq, so thank you very much. Uh, I would like to add uh, one or two points uh, as far as the power sector is content, uh, concerned. Okay, we have lots of generation and we are adding more generation, not no that about uh, in Basmaya and other places, but what is uh, uh, 
was lagging behind is the transmission, transmission sector and the distribution. Mm -hmm. And here the role of the Simmons contracts that we have, because all their contracts, they come to the Energy Council where I also sit there and I'm aware of, and we are supportive, of course. So there will be lots of uh, transmission lines additions, as well as substations, transformers, and this will enable the Ministry of Electricity to provide the power supply to various uh, suburbs within the cities that are not served. And this is what, real, what will make, you know, like a game changer, it will make uh, the uh, supply of power to the people of Iraq more efficient. Right. Thank you. Right. Thank no, that is, if I may, uh, it's because it's been a very good point. We tend to talk about those big, big, big generation projects, mm. but then we need to bring the power to the people, literally, and also make sure that the people pay, which is, should not be neglected. And that's why I feel so comfortable with our company, because like, unlike, in, you know, unlike any other company, we have the whole spectrum. We have generation, we are the world's largest renewable energy company. We have conventional energy, we have the grid, we have distribution, we have the smart grid, where you balance demand response between renewables and conventional. Then we have also the, the digitalization platform where people can actually order uh, power prepaid with a cell phone. Mm. And then once the $10 are run down, they need to you know, reload their, their capacity. And that's, I think, this comprehensive concept is very important to show results all the way. And that's why we are really very excited uh, that we can contribute. And the other thing is we localize, we want to build the factories here, we want to build the service here so that we create jobs and we can import from almost any region of the world. It can be China, it's the United States, it's Germany. So we are everywhere. We serve 203 countries in the world. And that also is something where we can help into, into geopolitical particularities just to make sure that the government and its people here in Iraq feel comfortable in what we do. Sure. So we started discussing the power sector. Maybe it's a good time to bring Mr. Abu Nehyan to the conversation. Um, you're a long-term long developer in Saudi Arabia. You develop renewables in the UAE. You're here in Baghdad. What are your plans for Iraq? Uh, I'm really extremely delighted to be here and join uh, this great conference and I'm really thankful to the Iraqi government. I'm, I'm coming here is really not to, uh, you know, just market or uh, promote. I'm coming here is to implement what has been really ordered to us from the highest of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, our king, our crown prince, is to give Iraq really a priorities but also to consider Iraq is Saudi Arabia when it comes to risk, when it comes to commitment, when it comes to deployment of resources. And to be sure and assured that we are going to deliver total solution, reliable, competitive, economical, socially sound, because you need really to do it, you know, uh, uh, really engaging the societies. But most important, uh, you know, with due respect to OEMs or EPC, we are not in the business of delivering, you know, uh, uh, EPC contract or operating only. What we are doing, we are committing upfront uh, big investment to be able to deliver, you know, the health and safety, uh, the environmental, and uh, the competitive, you know, really uh, cost where Iraq people deserve and bringing the highest efficiency and making it really sound economically to the country and to the people. And I have to say here in front of the panel that in Aqua Power, we are very proud today we are in 12 countries. We are investing in 12 countries. We have 54 assets in operation, 30 gigawatt today of power, 5.3 billion million of cubic meter of water, desalinated water. But all of this, the order has been very clear to us. All these priorities of countries that you are going, you are developing, keep business as usual, but pay attention to this country because for very, very important strategic reason. 
Iraq and Saudi Arabia at the top, at the highest, has 100% alignment and commitment on the political and the partnership and going forward. Our mandate is how we could make the economical side of that angle and how to embed it this long, long term of partnership economically and how to invest here. And I have to tell you very clearly here that we have no limit of five billion or 10 billion dollars or 15 billion dollars. We have, you know, it has been very clear that we are going to have investment without cap limit like Saudi Arabia. You know, when we are in Iraq, uh, in many countries that we have cap, we say we are having cap of asset allocation, of deploying of resources. Here, not. And the order was very clear for us. Gas to power. And I have to say here, and His Excellency Tamar Ghadban is aware of it, and he attended the meetings with the, uh, the Prime Minister, that Aramco is ready to come and do the gas, and we are ready to come and do the power. So we are giving a total solution to Iraq from the gas to the power, number one. Number two, we are committed to deliver the renewable program that Iraq would like to launch. And we would like to deliver also a different solution when it comes to being able to really, uh, you know, Iraq, as he said, His Excellency, very well, is, is not only the issue of generation, the issue of transmission and distribution. The great thing about renewable, you do not need this transmissions connection. And there is many areas and there is many regions in Iraq that you could make this renewable connected directly with the users. And this is the great of the distribution of really the combination of gas to power, of the renewable. And I have to say that uh, Iraq will suit two technology in the, in the solar. People thinking of PV. Yes, PV is great. It's a peaker. It's a few hours. You know, you need to have and to need to think of total solution of CSP and PV technology. And we are proud to say that we are the biggest today in the world in South Africa when it comes to storage in Morocco, in Dubai, we have 24 hours dispatch of solar. That's the first plant on earth will be dispatching. And also Iraq has a great resources when it comes to solar and wind resources. But we are looking with due respect to respond to the needs of Iraq, but we are not here for a short, medium term. We are here to stay for a very, very, very long term to train the people, localize the technology, but also to use Iraq is instead of today shortage of power, it's going to be the country to export power, to right. export really electricity to the regions. And Iraq has a great position today within the region to be able to be competitive at the long run to pass the need of the Iraq to beyond Iraq. And we are, as a company, we are really committed to make this happen, and we are going to make it as top of our priorities. And we have a discussion already going on, thanks to the, really, the Ministry of Electricity, Ministry of Petroleum, and all the stakeholders. We are discussing how to make this plan happen. And I'm sure, like any other countries, again, we need also legislation. Sure. We need some really clarity on, on really uh, the value chain when it comes to cost of production, distribution, collection, leakage of that also power to be sure that the eco of the whole uh, uh, solution, it is going to be sound not for me as an investor only. No, it's, it's for the country economics and to be able to have, uh, you know, as His Excellency uh, Tamil Ghadban has said it very clearly that, you know, it, it, is, it is a long way, but it's a journey and it's connected totally with production, transmission, distribution. Sure. So we'll talk about the challenges in a bit. Uh, I'll come back to you, uh, Mr. Tamar, one second. But what you're offering is unlimited capital, uh, conventional gas to power, as well as renewables. So, Mr. Thamer, um, what's the strategy for renewables? We have the great Iraqi poet, Badr Shakir Siyab, said, Shams Ajmal fi Biladi min Siwaha. 
the sun in my country is more beautiful than elsewhere. Are you planning to use this beautiful yeah. sun? Rahimallahu uh, Badr. Uh, now, the record of aquifer, I must say, is very impressive. Not what just he has said, of course, is very clear, but long, many years ago, I was aware and I had a meeting with their director general uh, in, in Oxford, actually. And uh, I was, uh, let us say, promoting the introduction of uh, uh, aquapower in, in, in Iraq. So we are, I am very happy that you are here really and what that. you said Thank is really excellent. Uh, but I would like to add a few, uh, two dimensions to it. First of all, uh, the geopolitics. Uh, the government of Iraq uh, is, uh, our has started this, uh, let us say, march of economic cooperation with all neighboring countries and beyond that. We have already signed 13 memorandum of understanding with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and two more country-to-country uh, -country agreement. This will be, they will be ratified by, by Parliament. But among those uh, 13, there is one for uh, power, or co um, dedicated to power, and one of them, of course, is connectivity uh, between Iraq and Saudi Arabia. And we have already, as a Council of Ministers, approved two more uh, 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 agreements. Uh, one is the connection, power, power grid connection between the uh, GECC and Iraq, that's two weeks ago, and also with the uh, Hashimite Kingdom of Jordan. So as far as, uh, uh, let us say, cooperation within power, uh, the power sector, it, yes, definitely we are definitely committed. Renewables, yes, they are strong in renewables. And uh, you, you mentioned the, 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 what the poet uh, uh, Badr Shakasi have talked about the sun and so on. Of course, the number of sun, uh, the number of the days of sunny days in Iraq is very impressive, very high on the high record, about 330 days a year. And uh, also, we have vast areas that can be utilized, especially the western part of Iraq, and also without this complication of transmission and so on. So many areas could be served. Uh, there is a program uh, within the Minister of Electricity to go ahead with power uh, renewable uh, generation and uh, uh, I hope we should have it even faster. We should have done earlier but still now in the uh, process of a first stage but definitely in the future ahead uh, as will be, it will be a, let's say a large share of the generation to be dependent not just on the on, 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 uh, uh, photovoltaic, but also on the CSP, as, as he's rightly said. Right. Thank you. Um, and do we have sort of a strategy towards using, using renewables, certain Cert targets by certain years? Certainly, yes, there is, yeah. No numbers yet? I mean, you could ask the Dr. Loey later. Okay. Yeah. We'll wait tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, we'll yeah. wait for Dr. Loey tomorrow. Right. Okay. Let me bring uh, Mr. Nwais to the conversation. You come up here from the United Arab Emirates. What is attracting you to Iraq? Why do you find Iraq attractive? I first want to thank you for inviting me to this to join this impressive and uh, experienced panelist. Uh, I must say I'm extremely pleased having Mr. Noyes, can you just get closer to the mic, please? Sorry. I must say I'm extremely pleased having driven yesterday from the airport to the hotel for I've, I last I was here four years ago. Still closer, if, if you don't mind. Sorry. About that. Uh, four years ago I was here, and the armed motor vehicle and the armed people around cement blocked blockade did not encourage uh, me to come again. But I must say yesterday I was extremely happy and pleased to see things have been removed, the roads are open, which, and people are on the street. I'm so happy for that. Allah ينعم على العراق بنعمة الأمن والأمان على طول إن شاء الله. This definitely inspiring confidence, inspiring us as an investor from the United Arab Emirates to come and look seriously. I had the pleasure and honor of meeting His Excellency Dr. Lai Al Khatib in Abu Dhabi, who kindly invited me here and encouraged us to come and look at investing in the power sector in Iraq. I see the potential, I can feel it. Having heard uh, His Excellency Thamar Al-Ghazban talking about 90% um, of 
the economy is dependent in oil, I see, and when I hear Dr. Luai saying that there are six gigawatt of gap on demand of power, if you want to diversify your economy, you want to go into industries like Joe Kayser said, and Iraq has all the potential to become an industrial giant. You have the oil, you have the gas, you have the phosphate, you have the population, you have the people. Uh, that means a drive towards industrialization will increase further the demand for power. We as a UAE investor are committed to Iraq. Iraq is a country with a close relationship to us. It's a great country, civilization, history, great people, talented people. Obviously, all that giving us the confidence to invest in Iraq, plus the market demand. We are interested, and I echo what my brother Mohammed said totally, gas to power or renewable, both are the future. We are committed to both gas to power and to renewable. Uh, we are willing to go all the way and commit more investment, not as big as my brother Mohammed, but we will do the best we can. Um, uh, this is, uh, uh, there is uh, potential and renewable, huge potential and renewable, I see. Um, we are open to all kinds of ideas and suggestions. We spoke with His Excellency the Minister about solar, about gas. So we are with you, Qalban wa Qaliban. Al Iraq uh, has a great place in our heart. The Iraqi people have a great place in our heart. We are committed and we will be with you all the way. Sounds good, thank you very much. Mr. Joe Kaiser, can I ask you a question? You had, um, you had done a remarkable job in Egypt. Um, you added, what, 14.4 gigawatt in 27 and a half months? Is that a, a world record? Um, would you be able to repeat that feat here in Iraq? Well, it has been a world record, definitely. And we not only did the 14,000 megawatt combined cycle with the three biggest power plants ever done, we also, we also did the whole energy value chain. As the minister rightfully said, I mean, it's great to produce power, but you need to bring the power to the people that it's consum consumed, and they need to pay for it. So it needs to be a, a, a you know, a, a integrated value chain, otherwise it doesn't do any good. What you can see in Egypt today is that now industrialization, GDP growth happens, because people have reliable and affordable power. And if we don't have this, nobody invests into industrial manufacturing, how could you? Now, on the other hand, mm. you know, Egypt is Egypt and Iraq is Iraq. So it does do a lot of good to say, well, we need to do the same thing here because the country is different. So you mentioned, sorry to interrupt you, but you mentioned you're working at the pace of the government in your speech. I assume that is uh, slower than the one you had in Egypt. What are the challenges? What are the different things that you're yeah, seeing? Yeah, well, here? I mean, if I, you know, there's nothing worse than an unasked advice to, especially to governments because they have their hands full. But um, if I had, if I, you know, if I was asked, what would you do if, uh, you know, if you were in my shoes uh, as one of the ministers or, or prime minister, rebuilding the country back to its pride, to its power, to its economic future, then I would probably tell them, consider a special committee where you, where you coordinate the most important matters for the country and the people, for economic development, to take it out of the normal, if I may say, bureaucracy of normal processes. And, you know, just take a handful and elevate it up. And say, okay, fine, there's a special committee, this is so important, we don't have room to fail, so we're gonna take it up personally. That's what I do if I have a very critical project. That's why I am, you know, the, 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 the salesperson, the developing person, the production person, the committing person to, Iraq, to the Iraq roadmap. And that's why I'm here four times in a row, because this is something I cannot afford to be wrong. So that's, uh, I would probably recommend, you know, take five projects, maybe 10, which are the most important ones to develop your country. 
and make good on the promises to the people and take it out of the normal processes of, uh, of, governmental, um, of governmental administration. Sounds good. Well, you have uh, all the important pe people here in Iraq. I'm sure they're listening to you. Um, I just want to go through a final quick round of questions before opening the floor for questions from the audience. We're celebrating today the 59th birthday of OPEC. Uh, we just talked about how global oil demand is outside OPEC's control. We're having part of the global supply, the U.S. shale, is out of OPEC's control. 59th birthday, is also is OPEC also becoming less relevant to the global oil market, Mr. Balkindo? Uh, to the contrary, uh, OPEC in the last uh, six, nearly 59 years of our existence today, uh, we've gone through six cycles, uh, and the last one being the longest the most impactful uh, in terms of prices collapsing by 80%, revenues of our member countries uh, also contracting by over one trillion US dollars. All our countries went into recession and it took us four years uh, to navigate through uh, this cycle. And in this process, since I've been in Vienna and it coincided with my coming to Vienna, I have had in several fora uh, people, informed people, uh, talking about the demise of OPEC. Mm. Uh, so you are not the only one talking about the irrelevance of OPEC, but we have uh, demonstrated time and time again uh, our longevity, our resilience, uh, the growing importance of this organization to the extent for the first time in history now we are working with OPEC, uh, non-OPEC uh, countries uh, who thought some years ago that these countries would sit down with us, uh, take decisions together, implement the decisions together, and even monitor the implementation at ministerial level, uh, like the meeting that uh, Samir just came from. Uh, this, is, uh, this is historic, very innovative. It shows the power of collaboration. And together, we, rem we are more confident now that we'll be able to weather whatever market storm that may come our way because the, unfortunately uh, the industry is cyclical, the market is cyclical, so we can't do anything about that. But what we didn't have in 2014 when this cycle uh, started, uh, we have it now. We have the declaration of cooperation, we are working with our non-OPEC partners, now we have signed the charter, first uh, ratified here by Iraq, and we, we have opened other producers to join. It's not only 24. So we are on more solid ground uh, at the moment. Sounds good. Okay. Um, I have plenty of other questions, but maybe it's fair to open the floor for questions from the audience. I'll take three questions at a time. Please make it a question, not a statement, uh, and a short one tell us who you're addressing it to. So there's one here, and then two. Any more questions? No? Oh, there's one there, and then one gentleman here, one from each side. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, happy birthday to OPEC, Mr. Parkindo. It's We are proud as Iraqis of OPEC, and we have a special relation with the organization, and it's so fitting that you are here in Baghdad on this beautiful day. Allow me to ask the question to Mr. Kaiser. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, Kaiser, this is the, uh, a, a great speech that you gave. And I want to highlight one thing that it is actually very important and it doesn't get covered uh, uh, here and uh, in Iraq and many areas where your great company and other companies are working, which is that you bring more than just building infrastructure, but you are bringing employment, training, and innovation. And this is the one thing that normally people look for when you have major contracts on major companies I commend you for highlighting that and I would really like for you to elaborate on it a little bit so every conversation and every discourse we have here will include this so we, other companies can have you as the yardstick for this performance. Thank you very much and thanks for a great panel. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have uh, a lady over there and then on the, on the right here, where's the mic? Just there. And then there's a gentleman on the left. Here, here. 
and then this gentleman, gentleman on the left, so if you can get the mic to him as well, so he saves time. Thanks so much. Um, thank you to all of you for your interventions and for your comments. And Ziad, you mentioned we were going to talk about Twitter. So I'd like to go back to the political um, stimuli or the political kind of events that might set off some, some market changes and what uh, a number of you are expecting in, in, in the months ahead, especially as it comes to regional instability. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we have a gentleman there. I think if we have one mic, I think it makes, use, it makes sense to actually make an efficient use of time and discuss um, the question here or the statement about um, Siemens being what we economists call a positive externality. It's not only bringing power, but there's a lot of CSR and other things, training, employment. So do you want to elaborate that on that, Mr. Kaiser? Well, I'm happy to. I'm a, I'm a very strong believer that this, what Milton Friedman said in the 1970s, that the business of business is business might have been true at that time because what he essentially said is, he said, you managers, you run your company, you make money for your shareholders, and you stay out of trouble. That's what he said. And uh, he has a point. I believe today in the modern world, you know, much more depends on stakeholders. You have the customers, you have the employees, and uh, you have the shareholders. That's the traditional one. Now, the employees need the customer, and the shareholders need the customer, so the customer is not a conflict. So with that, you traditionally had labor versus capital, right? The old sort of Karl Marx thing. In the, in nowadays, there is a third power, and the third power on stakeholders is society. People want to have a right to speak up. Now some areas are more encouraging, those people, others are less. But the modern civilization, I believe, requires that companies also consider society. And that's why I say the purpose of our company is to serve society. The only one thing which people must not forget you can only serve society. You can only promise to reinvest the money into building society to the greater good of people if you are competitive, if you are innovative, and if you finally make the money to give it away again to the stakeholders. And this is something I have, uh, I have uh, implemented in our company. We say, look, if we go places to help here build a society. We are going to stay and invest the money there. And if our shareholders are long-term oriented, if our shareholders respect the sustainability of the stakeholder approach, they're going to be pretty nicely off. If, they, if our shareholders only want to make short-term money by the quarter or by the year, we are the wrong company. And then I honestly, you know, uh, recommend to my shareholders, if you don't believe in the long-term development of societal values, sell your shares in Siemens and buy somebody else's. And that's our approach. And this is why we go into societies and say, look, what can we do? Where can we make a difference? What can we reinvest in, um, in education? in training, in innovation, because that, at the end of the day, bridges, bridges governmental, territorial challenges. I'm, our company is in 203 countries in the world. I'm in the United States, 60,000 people, hard-working, good American people. I'm in China, 50,000 people. We are in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I'm in Russia. So, you know, they are all my people. So I'm a notch above the territorial particularities, which I respect, but you know, I can reallocate my resources anytime in the world, and that's why we are very, very into this societal economic value chain and reinvest in the country. And that's, uh, I believe, is an approach which is courageous because there's a lot of hedge funds and a lot of activists out there who, you know, tell you, well, you better watch out, uh, but the 
the, le le the, le the, the, the legitimization of what I say comes from the fact that I need to be as competitive, as successful as my competitors, preferably better. And as soon as I can manage that, you know, I have the right to say, I serve the stakeholders and not only the shareholders. Sure, so there's a question there, but let me just uh, follow up with this, because there's a point mentioned about politics, you mentioned competitors, we're talking about geopolitics. A few months ago, you were on Bloomberg TV talking to my colleague Manus Krani, and you criticized the US administration for exerting pressure on Iraq in favor of a competitor that is GE. How are you dealing, do you see still that, do you still see that happening? How are you dealing with this? Well, look, I mean, um, um, I, I deliberately mentioned that we have a lot of people everywhere in the world. So, you know, I mean, we need to respect interests. And if, because you, 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 you mentioned that particular, and we have the ambassador here today too of the United States, I mean, you know, the United States says, look, we lost 7,000 lives to help this country to be freed up. You know, there's got to be something in return. I respect that. The good news is that I can also ship from Charlotte or, uh, or, or other of the, of the 47 factories we have in that country. So I can actually, you know, accommodate legitimate interests. And that's the good thing which we have so we can actually help integrate interests and then at the end of the day, with all due respect of national priorities and national interests, with all due respect, at the end of the day, what really matters is the customer. And they determine what we need to do and how we do it because they pay our salaries. And that's why they are, they are in the focus and I really have to, have to say that the, the, the current ministers on oil or electricity they are hardworking people. They really want to get something done. And I have the utmost respect. They are tough. Every time I come, they say, you need to lower the price. Um, <laughs> but they are get something done. And they are very, very high integrity people. And that is important in a country where we have seen other developments too. Well, it's good to be a hard negotiator. There's a one question here. And then there's a comment from Dr. Lue after this. Um, where is the mic? Oh, the mic is here. So. Let's get Alia and then Dr. Loey and then here. Thank you, Ziyad, for the very interesting panel. Alia Mubayad, Chief Economist for the MENA at Jefferies. I have a question for Minister Radban. I mean, uh, to what, how uh, uh, Iraq compliance with, uh, with the OPEC, uh, with your quota, and improved compliance with, uh, with your oil quota can affect your budgetary perspective for 2020. Clearly, we have seen that Iraq's budget 2019 had difficulty squaring the circle at these oil level. What can you tell us about the perspectives for the budget for 2020, given your determination to comply with your quotas? Okay, um, what, what, is, what has been let us, practice in the past years, uh, there is always an assumption about what would be the expected uh, oil price in, the, in the, next, the prevailing oil price as an average figure and also um, a planned uh, export rate. They don't talk about, within the budget, they don't talk about production, but of course, within OPEC, it's a production quota, not export. Um, um, now, right now, the, the, there is continual discussion within the government, also within parliament, with the financial uh, committee and uh, oil and gas committees and so on. Uh, it is too early to say right now, but of course we feel there is a pressure, no doubt. If the, uh, the price is, uh, the prevailing price, uh, if it is be below 56, that what was assumed this year, we managed so far, right now, by the end, by the end of September, with what we have exported, excluding the export from KRG, with the prevailing prices from 1st of January till end of September, so far the Minister of, of Oil has fulfilled its obligation, even without the contribution from KRG. Uh, if the, the price is 
between say 55, 60 will be okay. We can manage it with the quota that we are committed to and we are planning of course to keep our conformity as we have agreed. But I hope that uh, the coming uh, weeks shall unfold an agreement between us and KRG and that uh, what will be uh, stipulated in the annual budget law for 2020 should be of course respected and adhered to. Thank you very much. Okay, so Dr. Loi, you have a question or a comment? Thank you, Ziad. I know my slot is tomorrow morning, but I thought just to answer your questions on renewables, I just want to stress this point that uh, the Ministry of Electricity is working hard to uh, basically establish a good market uh, for renewables. At the moment, uh, well, we just recently um, uh, launched a, a bid round uh, for the first renewable uh, solar farms um, uh, that um, could attract investment for 755 megawatts uh, this year. And as of next year, we are planning to launch more and more opportunities that could bring uh, 1,000 megawatts year on year. And uh, we are attracting more and more companies. Our objective is to create an energy mix that sustain our power supply as we progress over the years, achieving 20% by 2030. Uh, we are reforming our market uh, 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 conditions and, and, and parameters and commercial uh, frameworks in a way to create a more and more fierce uh, competition. And that's why, Mr. Kayser, we ask for more and more discount as we, as Iraq becoming more prosperous and safer. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Uh, first of all, I'd like to give the uh, congratulations for the uh, uh, OPEC, or brother organization for 59 years to the uh, Deputy Prime Minister and also the Secretary General, because uh, here is the place it's a birthday place uh, for OPEC. And also, as uh, uh, the uh, uh, Iraq is a member uh, country of the uh, IEF also, it's the first time for me, for the IEF, to join this uh, Iraq uh, the energy uh, meeting. So uh, these are the congratulations. Second one, I'd like to have a quick question for the, uh, uh, the uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister, uh, Samir. That is, uh, what is your, the top three of the most important issue on your desk? In that case, I have in some way work together with our brother organizations, some way to uh, to cooperate, to support. Thank you. So top three, yeah. Well, I, I was planning to mention them in my speech, but because of the time and the arrangement of this uh, session. Okay, number one is of course is to keep up production and export capacity, build up, and I have of of course the flexibility and make sure that the infrastructures, storage tanks, pipelines, offshore loading terminals, offshore uh, uh, pipelines are all intact uh, with high confidence and so on. Number two, and those priorities, by the way, they go together. Uh, number two is gas, is maximizing utilization of gas. I have already approved two big contract, two mega project. Two weeks ago, I went to, to Basra and uh, we approved the, uh, the 400 million scuff per day of gas processing facilities for the Basra Gas Company, which is, as you know, it's a joint venture between uh, Iraq and uh, Shell and Mitsubishi. Uh, it is already actually already now being uh, manufactured and we hope that within less than three years it will be in place uh, to process 400 million. Uh, the other one which was approved earlier is a 300 million scope per day, the utilization of gases produced in Halfaya uh, gas field. So and we are now negotiating with another company, I, we mentioned the name, no problem with that, it's Honeywell UOP. Bechtel Consortium for another 300 million. So when you add them together, and uh, previously last year, a 200 million also a scope per day was uh, approved, a total of 1.2 billion cubic feet per day of a new processing facility. The, those, those four mega projects, once they are uh, implemented, and they will be implemented, we are serious about that, 
uh, they will take all those flares that you see in Basra and around Basra and then we will end up with candles. I, uh, that's what we are determined to do. Uh, a third one is uh, refining capacity, is that we have to uh, modernize, upgrade our existing refineries and we are also working on expanding uh, uh, our refining capacity by building a new more uh, a new uh, refineries either on on improved investment models or even we go as partners uh, together with the future to be investors uh, a number of them let's say first priority will be the FAO and the Basra to major refineries because the, the availability of oil there uh, and most important the proximity a nearby uh, shoreline the investor could also export a product without the need for long pipelines and so on so these are they, they go together we have other of course a project within the gas context we are, are giving a priority to exploration for free gas in the western desert we already signed the contract and we are going to sign more and for that one of the uh, uh, points related to that is that uh, the role of Saudi Aramco we have already sent uh, uh, two two delegations and they visit there and we are and so we welcome Aramco to come and explore for gas or uh, as the other uh, two uh, gentlemen mentioned the power to gas uh, if there is any model they come with that is uh, quicker or faster than the traditional uh, uh, let's say scheme we are using building NGLs and so on if there is oh, there are I know but if they are coming with a, a power gas to power generation a quick fix well we will be definitely uh, welcoming them on that thank you well, that's great so I have, I have tens of other questions I'm sure the audience do have questions regional cooperation gas refining in Iraq the future of oil the challenges of working in Iraq uh, but I promise the organizers I'll finish on time and I'm already four minutes over time so Please join me in thanking the panelists for their insights and their thoughts um, and the, the great discussions they gave us. Thank you.